In today's episode... Some of the people who have the greatest degree of leverage in the world are the people who run organizations, uh, whether it's a not-for-profit like Charity Water or yeah. it's a for-profit like Google, yeah. they live in email. Yeah. And if you can make those people faster, if you can save them hours a week, then you, you end up having this crazy impact across a variety mm. of different walks of life. And, yeah. You know, I said this when I was recruiting my co-founders, Conrad and Vivek, I said to the both of them, you know, I thought about this a long time, and I just came to the realization that I personally am not going to have a huge impact on curing cancer yeah. or preventing famine or stopping war. But maybe we can make the tools for the people that do. Mm. Maybe we can be the company that builds the best tools in the world. Yeah. And all of the progression of mankind has ultimately come down to building better and faster and more productive tools. Yeah. And that's something that I happen to be world class at. And that's something where we can credibly say we're going to build the best tools company in the world. Rahul, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, so, man, I've been reading all about you and Superhuman and kind of following you for some time. So I'm really excited to have you on, on the show. You're wearing your famous jacket that I've seen <laughs> in other interviews and uh, news articles and stuff like that. So uh, thanks for being on brand today. And um, so, look, I mean, this show is all about how you turn ideas into action. And I think what you guys have done at Superhuman, we're going to go into what Superhuman is and how you've created this company um, is just very unique and uh, I think you've employed really smart tactics and uh, frameworks to the way you've kind of grown your company systematically and I think there's a lot a lot of people can learn from what you guys have done um, so we're going to go into a few of those kind of frameworks today um, but before we get into that like who are you man like why did I ask you for an interview and uh, what is superhuman sure in your own words uh, well, for, for those of your audience who don't know me, my name is Rahul. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Superhuman. Yeah. And Superhuman is the fastest email experience of all time. Yeah. So our users get through their inbox about twice as fast compared to in Gmail. Yeah. And many of them see inbox zero for the first time in years. So I've also heard you be described as the future of work um, by, I think, Andreessen Horwitz, one of your lead investors. Um, when they say something like that, what do they mean, the future of work? Is that something you've thought about yourself as well, or is that just people putting words in your mouth? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's a little bit of, I would say, uh, insider jargon yeah. to Silicon Valley. It's one of the hottest areas for venture capitalists to invest in right now, especially at the, the seed and the Series A stage of investment. Uh, I think that you know, for a long time, people had regarded work software is kind of done. Mm. There had been this uh, phase, the consumerization of the enterprise, essentially bringing the mm. uh, high production values that we enjoy in our consumer software to software that we use at work. Uh, and that phase was you know, well underway. Yeah. Um, now, what we've seen uh, in recent years with companies like Slack is that collaboration and productivity are by no means done. Okay. And there's a ton of headroom uh, to make 10x better products. And Superhuman is, is an example of that. You know, yeah. We've taken email where for 10, 20 years, you've had these commodity products, mm. Gmail, Outlook, both of which are one size fits all solutions. Yeah. And we said, you know what? We can build a very, uh, very differentiated, niche, exceptional product in mm. this market. Yeah. And I think a lot of people listen to this are saying, when I first heard about Superhuman, if I'm really honest, I thought, cool, this sounds really interesting. But like many new products, you think, oh, well, I've already got Gmail. I've already got Outlook, as you said, or, or Hotmail back in the day, right? So, I mean, and just digging into your business model, you know, for people straight off the bat, you guys charge thirty dollars a month, right? That's so right. this is a premium. If, would you describe it as premium or, or not? Really? I, I would. It's okay. designed for the people for whom email is work and work is email. Yeah. So our users are typically doing three hours or more of email a day. Mm. Would you not say most office workers are spending their time more than three hours a day anyway? Or like, when? How do you quantify that? 
So that's actually the average number is about three hours a day. Yeah. There's roughly one billion professionals in the world. Mm. And on average, those billion professionals spend three hours of email a day. Okay. So you can consider us as aiming for the top half of that market. Okay. And um, and just to give a sense of size, because you've just raised, I think it was $33 million was what was reported. So I don't know if you're able to share the exact numbers on that. At a $260 million valuation is what I read. So is that roughly in the right ballpark? Yeah, that was our last round of fundraising. So yeah. that brings us to a total raise now of just north of $50 million, Great. Uh, which I think many commentators have said, you know, that that's a hell of a lot of money for taking on this space. Yeah. Uh, and it is. And the reason why we have raised that much is it turns out that it's actually very, very difficult mm. to make a product that people prefer over Gmail and more than Outlook. Um, but it's something that we're dedicated to doing. And so that's why we raised that cash. That's great. I'm also just going to call out a couple things that from my research that I found. So you have recently featured on New York Times. I think it was the front page of the business section or something right. like that. Uh, really interesting article. I'll link to that in the description as well. Um, you've got 180,000 um, user wait list to be on this product. Is that accurate or is uh, that? 220,000. Oh, wow. So it's gone up since the last time I read. So that's 220,000 people saying, I'm ready to pay. I'm ready to pay $30 a month. So this isn't a case of you're trying to find people willing to pay. There are people waiting in the wings to actually pay to use this product. Absolutely. And you've purposely slowed down your growth to a point where you're only accepting people in at a steady pace that you can onboard them in a way that you feel makes sense. And we're going to go into some of the details of that approach a bit later. Um, I also saw um, you describe kind of like how you go up against a Google in the first place, right? Because when you start an idea like this uh, four or five years ago, whenever, when did you start? It was four years ago? Was, I personally... <laughs> we're in 2019, because you asked that. <laughs> well, uh, I personally got going uh, very early. I, I was thinking about Superhuman uh, even when I was at LinkedIn. So I sold my previous company, Reportive, to yeah. LinkedIn. Uh, and I distinctly remember the lunchtime there. Mm. I was probably halfway during my period at the company where uh, I, I said to the reportive crew, because we all we all used to grab lunch together, hey, I've got this, this idea yeah. for the fastest email experience of all time. Um, and I just kind of, you know, planted the seed and mm. let it ruminate for a year. Uh, as soon as I left LinkedIn, I incorporated the company uh, and then really started getting going on it around Q3 of 2014. Okay. So that's coming up to five years now for how long I've been doing that. Yeah. Uh, and then around summertime of 2015, I brought on board uh, the early founding team, so two co-founders yeah. uh, and one of the first founding engineers. Okay. And you, because this is also an approach that I found quite interesting because you were basically building in stealth mode, it seems like, or kind of in private beta or something like that for some time. Uh, you were saying, we need to spend enough time to actually go and build something that's worthy of being charge for at $30 a month. Um, and and so that's quite an interesting approach too, because, and I think it's quite a Silicon Valley centric kind of model. I don't see too many companies around the world, even in a position to raise X amount of money to build something for several years. Um, and, and there's kind of pros and cons to both sides, but was that a conscious decision that you said, I'm just gonna take as long as it takes, or did you have a kind of target in mind when you when you started up? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and actually, uh, I think it's a very unusual mm. approach for a Silicon Valley company. Right, okay. you know, most Silicon Valley companies uh, live and die mm. uh, by how fast they're growing. Yeah. And so it requires a very deliberate mindset from the beginning and also extremely patient investors mm. to say, you know what, we're going to spend in the region of three to four years just building the product. Yeah before we attempt to grow the user base or to grow revenue. Uh, but yes, we, we did deliberately set out with that in mind. And that's because, you know, I've been here long enough now, I've seen many companies um, come and go, and mm. especially in our space productivity, there is this pattern yeah. that happens time and time again where you get these exceptionally talented teams, they raise some money, and what happens is towards the end of that cash runway, they're like, oh, we're, we're about to run out of money, now what do we do? Mm. And so what they inevitably do is they launch their product, but it's unfinished, it has bugs, mm. 
And if you're building something as mission critical as email, where people are going to be in it for three hours a day, yeah. well, they'll come in and give it a go because no one loves Gmail and no one loves Outlook. Mm. But unless the product is amazing, they'll immediately churn out. Yeah. And the only way to get around that mm. is to give yourself the, the time it truly takes to build something that's good enough that people will stick with. Yeah. And so I walked into this knowing that that's what it would take. Mm. And we have picked our investors primarily on the basis for them to see the long-term vision and be patient with us as we build. That's great. Because that, that's such a, you're right. And when I said it was a typical Silicon Valley thing, I think more so, I've only really seen it in Silicon Valley versus uh, it being the norm in Silicon Valley. So, um, but I love the fact that you're really building for the long term and you're saying, okay, well, we're trying to create something, not just email, from my understanding, it's gonna go way beyond email in the long run with maybe calendar, to-do list, task management potentially as well. So um, so I really, I see the long-term potential, but when I initially saw the company, I just saw the headline, Silicon Valley startup charging $30 a month. I did think if I'm honest, oh, like how much better can it be? It's kind of like when I moved to New York and I said, how much better can pizza be? You know, it's <laughs> like you think, oh, I've had pizza before, but then you, you try it and you're like, okay, this is much better than right. normal pizza. So, <laughs> so, um, so like, I, I do want to give a sense of, you know, a lot of people listening to this either haven't used Superhuman or um, might not have seen what it looks like. So what are some of the features that are really popular that people really stick with the product for? Yeah, great question. Uh, before I jump into that, it yeah. might be helpful to, you know, remind folks mm. what, the, what the evolution of Gmail and the ecosystem around Gmail has Definitely. been. Uh, and, you know, for those that don't know, uh, my last company, w which you mentioned, Reportive, we yeah. were the first Gmail extension to get to uh, many millions of users. Yeah. And we built a sidebar into Gmail. Basically, when people emailed you, we showed you what they look like, where they work, yeah. their recent tweets, links to their social uh, media profiles. Mm. And it turns out that lots of people really love that, especially folks in sales and recruiting and business development. And so we ended up selling that company to LinkedIn mm. back in 2012. And when I was at LinkedIn, I ran all of our email integrations for about two years mm. and saw that company. Is grow. that what became LinkedIn Sales Navigator? Is that Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. So th this is the email uh, integrated component of LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Yeah. So during that period, I became intimately familiar with yeah. how professionals do email. And yeah. the TLDR is quite badly, yeah. uh, often not with very much thought. Uh, and I saw Gmail bizarrely get worse every single year. Yeah. Uh, so, so you were at Google for a while, like you may remember Gmail back in 2004, 2005. When it first came out, it, it was, was amazing. amazing. And right? everyone's like, wow, this is like unlimited storage, super quick. Yeah, uh, it was really bloated, fast. But over time that's evolved. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. It was really fast, it wasn't bloated, it wasn't cluttered, it had one thing, email, mm. and it did it really, really well. Yeah. Now over time, um, and this is a really interesting phenomenon which we can circle back to, mm. but over time it's become considerably more bloated. Uh, and I think that is uh, a direct reflection of a phenomenon called Conway's Law. Mm. Uh, so for, for those of the audience who maybe they're software engineers or they studied computer science, there's a very famous book that basically every CS student reads, the, yeah. the Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks, yeah. right? And maybe you're familiar with the idea and the, the core thesis of that book is you can't double the size of an engineering team and halve the time it takes to, to do an engineering project. But he also makes reference to another law called Conway's Law. Yeah. And that law states that every single product or service grows to represent the structure of the organization that makes it. Yeah. Meaning when you look at a product, you can literally see the structure of the organization. When you say structure, what, what does that mean? Uh, well, for example, let's say you're yeah. looking at Gmail now, yeah. right? Mm. And you have your little Hangouts thingy on the bottom left. <laughs> yeah, You've yeah. got the search bar at the top right. You've got the mm. increasingly large user account widgets in the uh, top right as well. Yeah. Um, the productivity sidebar over on the right. Uh, I, I've been working in large, I have worked in large companies doing product management yeah. long enough. I know that when I look at that user interface, what I'm actually seeing is the product management structure of mm, Gmail. I love and that. And you can actually see the turf wars play out <laughs> as the different PMs are jostling and fighting for, for yeah. resources and real estate and uh, everything that's required to make their metrics go up. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah. just to add to that really quickly, I was with my friend this weekend, Joseph, who worked with me at Google Android Marketing for some time. And now he's at Stripe. But we were actually talking about this, and you guys use OKRs, I assume. We do. Right? So quarterly OKRs, objective key results, right? Which is a great framework for many companies to kind of set their vision for what they need to do. But when you get to a certain size, and we saw this at Google from my own experience anyway, you would ship stuff, you know, ship meaning release products before they were ready mm -hmm. because it was part of someone's OKRs. Exactly. And that, and that seems like it kind of builds on from what you're saying, which is, You've got the Hangouts team fighting for space and the Google Plus team at one point trying to fight for space. And then there's search, obviously, calendar kind of thrown in there. So that's a great point. So you have purposely tried to stay clear of, of that and make sure that you're aligned around one vision. Is Ex that exactly. Kind of the punch I think what we're really circling around here is organizationally, large companies find it difficult to create products with clear, coherent and compelling visions. Mm. And that's one of the reasons that we will endeavor to remain small yeah. and to c really concentrate and crystallize the vision of what we're trying to build, which is the fastest email experience of all mm. time. Uh, but jumping back to the previous thread, I was, you know, I was explaining what yeah. I think went wrong with Gmail. That was definitely one of the things. Yeah. Uh, this product management driven mm. way of creating products leads to unclear products. And then on top of that, it's yeah. got significantly slower Back in the day, it yeah. was really fast. Uh, Paul Buhait, employee number 21 or three at of, Gmail. He's a guy that- uh, sorry, of, of Google, rather. Yeah. yeah, he was the guy that you know sat down and made Gmail. Yeah. So he's actually an investor in Superhuman. Oh, wow, we we okay. would talk about this uh, a lot. Um, he had this rule when he mm. created Gmail, which was every single interaction should take place in 100 milliseconds or less. Yeah. Why? Because that's roughly the threshold at which point interactions feel instantaneous. Mm. And today, Gmail is no longer like that. Clicking on an email can take a second. Searches can take many seconds. And again, that's something that we've taken extremely seriously yeah. at Superhuman. Uh, it still doesn't work properly offline, mm. right? And yeah. for those, uh, and, and our customers who uh, they're often executives or founders or managers or they're traveling a lot whilst doing their work, they find that very difficult to deal with. Yeah. Now, on top of that, yeah. to make all of this significantly worse, yeah. people over the last 10 years have started added adding plugins and uh, yeah. extensions into Gmail. Yeah. So my previous company, Reportive, being one of the first, mm. but you will have heard of Boomerang, yeah. Mixbacks, Clearbit, mm. Yesware. Uh, there are so many nowadays. Yeah. And each one of those takes all of the problems that we just talked about. Visual clutter, mm. bloat, lack of coherency to the vision, uh, speed, offline, and it makes all of those problems dramatically worse. Yeah. Because they weren't made for that to work with the others. Like I've had, for example, sales uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator I right. use in Gmail. And when I've used Boomerang in the past, they don't really work well together. And right. it stops working and then I have to uninstall something and who wants to deal with that? Right, because right, so. there is no API, there is no plugin architecture. Yeah. These are literally bits of code that are constantly mm. sort of uh, on a loop and on a timer checking to see if the, the page has changed. And yeah really eats into your battery and they don't work well together. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So we said, okay, what would Gmail look like mm. if it were built from scratch and with today's technology mm. and not 15 years old with 15 years of other people's software glued on top? Yeah. And the answer is it would be blazingly fast. Every single interaction would take place in 100 milliseconds or less. Searches would be nearly instantaneous. Yeah. It would be visually gorgeous. It would have all of the power of the, the Gmail plugin ecosystem built in natively, mm. and yet would still be subtle, minimal, visually gorgeous. Yeah, It would work offline so you could be productive anywhere, even if you were in the back of an Uber mm. or on a plane with terrible go-go internet yeah. Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And ultimately, it would make you twice as fast at, at what you do. Mm. That's great, man. And I think I think um, you sell it really well. Obviously, this is your job. But I think for people who might be listening and thinking like everything's so quick, you know, already, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate here. And if you think of like smartphones as an example, now we've got to stage where iPhones and the top Android phones are all so good in many ways that it's quite hard to incrementally 
increase what people use them for, right? And and a lot of people are no longer upgrading to the new iPhone straight away. They're waiting a couple of years because what they already have works quite well. And I think I can imagine some some people listening to this thinking, well, it's great if it um, if it's that much quicker, but do I actually need that? And what I would potentially say to those people is, you have to kind of experience it to be able to understand like the joy of a product that works that well. And often there's only you know, designers like yourself or product people like yourself that actually know that in, in the details. Whereas as a normal consumer, we don't know that. We just kind of use a product and say, this is cool or it isn't. Exactly. And a lot of it's instinctive. Yeah. So um, where does that, that number come from that you mentioned the 50 milliseconds or something like that? Oh, where does it come from? Uh, well, it, it has a deep heritage. Yeah. Um, I think that there were academic studies done over the course of the last 50 years to yeah. show how people perceive delays. Yeah. And around 100 milliseconds is perceived as instantaneous. Yeah. One second or more, and you risk your user being distracted and switching task. Yeah. And there's this really interesting study that was done more recently, mm. uh, I believe by McKinsey, on the cost of an interruption. Mm. And it turns out that when you're interrupted, it takes you about 23 minutes to, to recover from that interruption. Mm. And that has many implications that go well beyond the scope of this conversation, but it, yeah. you know, it makes you wonder about, uh, are open floor office plans a good thing? Yeah. Are notifications on your desktop, on your phone a good thing? Yeah. Well, the answer to those two questions is probably not. Probably not, yeah. <laughs> um, but but back, to, back to email and software in general, mm. if, if you have software where delays are approaching a second, well, then chances are your users are going to get distracted. Yeah. I mean, Google... For so famously for so many years has worked on the the core Google search being instantaneous. Now it's so fast that it's literally as you're typing, you're it's, seeing search yeah, results. Crazy. Why? So you don't get distracted. Mm. So you get to that result as quickly as yeah. possible. And I think also just uh, adding on to that, in my world of kind of marketing, digital marketing, I've worked with a lot of retail businesses, e-commerce businesses, and and people again will think, okay, well, how much does a second make a difference? It makes a huge difference. Right. If you think of page speed as another parallel to this conversation around email, when you're loading, you know, Nike.com, and it takes an extra second or an extra two seconds to load, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but the conversion rate decreases significantly. Right. I'm so not that's, surprised. And um, that's why even for SEO and that sort of stuff, page speed has become such an important indicator of a good quality website. Uh, that you're now punished if you if your page loads slowly. Um, 100%. So I think we, we do automated speed testing as well. So yeah. one of the rigs that we have is uh, on a slow internet connection, load yeah. Gmail and then load Superhuman at the same time. Mm. And what you'll find is Gmail will take in the region of seven to ten seconds to be active and available. Uh, and we aim to keep Superhuman load. We aim to get it loading loaded in the region of uh, one to two seconds. Okay. Wow. So it sounds like, and, and I kind of, just to build on what you said, so thanks for sharing that. I think one of the things that stood out to me as someone observing from the outside was just how many people I saw on Twitter and, you know, social media in general saying, I've just had the most amazing experience with Superhuman. And I kept hearing your name. And part of me, the cynic in me says, are these people just kind of jumping on the hype train? Uh, are they Are they trying to kind of, signal value is another area that I've experienced and I think for a certain percentage of people that is a thing the same way luxury goods signal value um, but then the more I actually spoke to said oh actually no it's actually super quick it works really well and it saves me a bunch of time it's worth $30 a month um, and that kind of brings up the question of how big do you need to become to become a success in your mind right and I think when people think of these massive companies with billions in revenue and these numbers we hear in the news, we often forget what it takes to actually become a successful, you know, success story in as a person who started a company. And from my understanding, you're probably already very close to that stage of, you know, if you're charging $30 a month, um, you probably only need two to, th two to 300,000 people to be on a $100 million run rate for the year. Right, right from the calculations I did. So and and that from my research is probably at the stage where if you wanted to go public, you're able to go public. Exactly. Right. So is that something on the horizon for you that you guys think about uh, we need to hit a certain number of users to then have an exit like that or you know kind of what's your thinking around that? Yeah, so for me personally it's it's not really about the 
the size of the exit. I've I've sold yeah. a company in the past. Yeah. I'm not not particularly motivated to do that again. Yeah. Uh, it's more about th- there's this vision that we have mm. that encompasses many beautiful, amazing products that are going to make our lives significantly better. Yeah. And we really want to see those products come to life. Mm. Now, how do we do that? Well, we need to build a vehicle that is capable of doing that. We need to yeah. build an organization that can attract the best talent in the world, where people can come and do the best work of their lives yeah. to create the best products in the world. Mm. That's really what we're trying to create. Now, how do we do that? Well, you need to build momentum with mm. something. Um, in other words, you need to build a very fast-growing business. Now, how do you build fast-growing businesses? Yeah. Uh, well, you, you know, you started talking about it. Is yeah. uh, you raise venture capital, uh, and you try and find a line of revenue that can quickly scale. Mm. Uh, and a good rule of thumb is how quickly can you get to a hundred million dollars of revenue? Yeah. And most quick-growing software as a service companies are valued at roughly ten times revenue. And if you get to a hundred million dollar run rate, you can, for the most part, claim a, a billion dollar or a multi billion dollar valuation. And yes, you ought to be able to go public. Yeah. Uh, but I have no particular desire to go public. Yeah. Uh, my, my friends who've gone through that say it's not necessarily the best experience. Yeah. And they, they often miss the days when they were a private company. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it's it's all about leverage and can we build a company where people do the best work of their lives and build the best products in the world? Yeah. And I, I want, I'm curious to kind of dig into that a little bit more because I think I came from, you know, tech background as well. And one of the things that kind of drew me to the startup world in, let's say, mid 2000s or late 2000s um, was this kind of vision of creating a better world and these kind of idealistic kind of values. Um, and if I'm honest, I kind of went through this phase where, you know, I truly do believe in, you know, if you've created a company of value and people are transacting with their money, that in a weird way is kind of the greatest source of truth in a, in a world where we talk a lot more than we act. And what I mean by that is a lot of people complain about, I don't like this product, I don't like you know, Facebook spying on me and Google doing X, Y, Z. But like, I'll give one example where YouTube, for example, I worked on YouTube ads for a long time and people would complain about the five second skippable ad. And I, and then when Google launched the premium version where you could pay five or $10 a month to skip the ads essentially or to have no ads, so many people that complained would never actually sign up for the paid version of it. And, and I kind of went through this phase where I loved what was going on in the startup world, but then I kind of got turned off a bit, to be honest, because mm-hmm. I would meet a lot of people, really smart people that I'm sure were being genuine, but they would kind of have these grand visions of, we're gonna change the world with XYZ product. And I, I loved that to a certain extent, but then when I started meeting people like, let's say Scott Harrison, we were talking about before, founder of Chai to Water, who's trying to help you know, end the world war crisis, right? Very different kind of um, focus. Um, and not to say both shouldn't exist. I just kind of got to the point where I st- became a lot more energized by these kind of social impact orgs, right? And I kind of had to take a few years out of being around startup world because it, it was getting a little bit like too much talk. But, you know, from your perspective, if you were trying to do the best work of your life, like, this is one area, right, that you're working on right now, and you've also worked on a company you've sold before. Like, is there other areas that, are there other areas that you really think are worthy of spending your life's work on? I'm sure there are. Yeah. Uh, this is probably the highest leverage yeah. uh, area that I can be working on right now. Yeah. Let's see, so, you know, when I left LinkedIn, uh, I took about a year out to think of what I was going to do next, had many ideas that I was considering. Mm. uh, And I kept on coming back to this one. Mm. And in a sense, and maybe it sounds weird to say this, it was because I felt a call of duty. Mm. I knew that if I did not start superhuman, quite literally nobody would, Mm. right? No one would be crazy enough to start this company to raise the boatloads of money that you need, to put the team together and to spend the many years required to build a product if I didn't do it. And I knew it was something that the world needed Mm. because some of the people who have the greatest degree of leverage in the world are the people who run organizations, uh, whether it's a not-for-profit like Charity Water or it's a for-profit like Google, they live in email. And if you can make those people 
faster, if you can save them hours a week, then you you end up having this crazy impact across a variety mm. of different walks of life. And yeah. you know, I said this when I was recruiting my co-founders, Conrad and Vivek, I said to the both of them, you know, I thought about this a long time. And I just came to the realization mm. that I personally am not gonna have a huge impact on curing cancer. Yeah or preventing famine or stopping war. But maybe we can make the tools for the people that do. Mm. Maybe we can be the company that builds the best tools in the world. Yeah, And all of the progression of mankind has ultimately come down to building better and faster and more productive tools. Yeah, And that's something that I happen to be world-class at. And that's something where we can credibly say, we're gonna build the best tools company in the world. That's great. And I love that that you mentioned the kind of self-awareness there, right? To say, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I'm really good at, and this is how I can have a disproportionate impact across different sectors. I think that's a great thing. How did you kind of think about that? Because I think a lot of people listening to this struggle with knowing, you know, really truly knowing what am I good at and marrying that with their passions and interests, you know? Because for example, I love playing football, soccer in America, but football where we're from but I'm not going to be Thierry Henry playing for Arsenal right so like if I just followed my passion I'd try to be a footballer and not really do anything right whereas I'm actually pretty good at looking at data and being able to make decisions very quickly better than a lot of people and that happens to translate into something that is really boring for some people but quite interesting for me that happens to be digital marketing right so like were there certain things that you've thought about over time you seem like quite an introspective person like were there kind of thoughts or conversations you have in your head to kind of figure those things out? I think the football example is interesting because it's one of those examples where it probably doesn't matter how hard you work. Yeah. If you're not genetically gifted, whether it's uh, through hand-eye coordination or the percentage of fast twitch muscle that you have, you know, footballers need to be able to sprint. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're unlikely to be able to yeah. operate at that world-class level. Mm. But for many of the activities that go into building a startup, mm. uh, you know, with myself, for example, uh, copywriting mm. or interaction design uh, or tweaking a product so that it it does all the things that you wouldn't have thought to ask for yet is delightful anyway. Mm. Those are actually learnable skills. Mm. Yeah. Those are uh it's like craftsmanship. You can apprentice yourself if you mm. wanted to. You can study it over the course of 10 or 20 years. Uh, and that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I've been programming since I was eight years old. Yeah. I've been designing software now for the better part of 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and when you, when you do something like that day in, day out, you can credibly claim to be very good at it mm. and operating on a world-class level. So I think the key is to find those things that you're good at and the intersection of those things with the things that you're interested in mm. or passionate about. And for me, I, I personally struggle with productivity a great deal. Yeah, okay. Which is kind of ironic. I'm not a very productive person. <laughs> really, okay. Yeah, I'm not a systems thinker. I'm not, mm. not very organized. Uh, I find it difficult to maintain focus. Yeah. And building superhuman in part is, is a very personal journey. Mm. It's, uh, you know, started with how can I make myself more productive? And then I realized that this is actually a problem that the world faces. Yeah. Everyone in the world could benefit from being more productive. Yeah. And if you make the world's leaders more productive, well, then you're having a massively outsized impact on the world. I love that, man. Well, thanks for kind of the intro. I know we went probably a little bit over time what I'd originally planned for that part, but I think it's a really good discussion to have to tee things up. What we're going to do to switch gears a little bit is to really dig into one of the areas which I think you've been um, definitely a pioneer in the last year or so from seeing how many people have taken your approach to finding product market fit. And we're going to define that in a second and really dig into it. Um, so we're going to go into that. And then we're going to go into the second part of the show. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the unique approaches you've taken to onboarding customers, um, things that like human onboarding, like not just a scalable thing that someone can sign up to um, online um, and give you money really quickly. You guys require a actual human to speak to you to onboard you for, I think, half an hour. Um, so we're going to go into all of that. 
Um, was there anything from your kind of like background that we didn't mention that would be worth mentioning before we move on? I think we did a very comprehensive. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Great. So let's move into the area around product market fit, right? So you've written this amazing epic blog post, I think on First Round Capital site, and I'll link to that in the show notes as well around finding product market fit. So for people listening who've never even heard of that term, how would you define product market fit and where it fits into the life cycle of um, starting a company? For sure. So the definition of product market yeah. fit is is actually the, the introduction of the article. And it was yeah. this thing uh, that I spent much of 2017 wrestling with. Uh, so for those who haven't heard the term, uh, it is this often nebulous concept that yeah. is it essentially means your product is working. Yeah. You have found a scalable market that has a demand for your product and your product is scaling within that market. Yeah. And it turns out that the companies that have product market fit, mm. by whichever way you care to define it or measure it, uh, are the ones that, that grow the fastest and the companies that don't almost always struggle to grow and mm. fail to become great companies. Yeah. So in 2017, we had been working on Superhuman at that point. Well, I had for about three years, the, the rest of the team for about two years. And it was very clear to me that we did not have product market fit. I knew that if we launched it, uh, the launch wouldn't go particularly well. And I was struggling for a way to explain this to the team. I, I couldn't just say that because these are hyper ambitious, super intelligent engineers yeah. that poured their hearts and their souls into building yeah. this product. So I went out on a quest, mm. a quest to find a way to define product market fit, mm. a metric to measure product market fit, and a methodology to systematically increase yeah. product market fit. And so, uh, you know, I went to the, the luminaries of Silicon Valley, Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, yeah. arguably the most successful early stage investor in the world, said that product market fit is when you've made something that people want. Yeah. It's a pretty good definition. It's a, it's a great bar to Nice and for. simple. But when you try to translate that into measuring it, I guess that's where it gets a bit more complicated. Exactly. Yeah. I, was, I was looking for a... Uh, a definition that you could put a metric on because yeah. when you have metrics on things, you can optimize them. Yeah. Back to the OKR conversation. Mm. And so uh, looking around again, I found a great definition uh, from Sam Altman who took over Y Combinator from Paul. And he said, product market fit is when your users love your product so much that they spontaneously, without you asking them, mm. tell other people about your product. Now, that's a very different characterization. Yeah. That's about uh, spreading the word and word of mouth growth. Yeah. Less so individual, Being single satisfied. player utility. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there are almost these two different dimensions that they're both touching on. Yeah. But I kept on looking. Uh, and then I found the definition by Mark Andreessen. And, mm. and this one is particularly interesting, yeah. both because it's very compelling and vivid, yeah. uh, but also because he was the individual to have coined the term mm products market fit back in the day yeah. uh, on his blog. And he has this, this wonderfully detailed definition of yeah. products market fit, which goes as follows. He says, you can almost always feel it mm. when products market fit is not happening. Mm. Customers aren't quite getting value. Users aren't quite growing fast enough. Word of mouth is not spreading. The press re reviews are kind of blah in the sales cycle is taking too damn long. Mm. But on the contrary, you can almost always feel it when product market fit is happening. Customers are buying as fast as you can add servers. You're hiring sales and support as yeah. fast as you can. The press are constantly calling about your hot new thing. Money is piling up in your checking account. Yeah. And investors are staking out your house. Yeah. Now that's a very good definition. Yeah, very a lot more detail than just the one line. Right. Yeah. And that was the definition that I was staring at through tears mm. in the summer of 2017 because I knew that we were not that, mm. right? None of those So that's why, because I, I read in your blog post, you said through tears. Yeah. And I was curious, like when you say tears, was that like you're saying because you said, oh, I'm not there and I'm putting my whole life's work into this. And did you feel like disappointed? Did you feel like you 
had failed? Like, what was it that brought you to tears, do you think? I think I felt all of the above, disappointed, yeah. scared, maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, after all, my last company had started, scaled, and been acquired in less time. Yeah. Right? Like that two was, years, it right? Was it was actually 20 months. It was oh, just wow. it was really fast. And here we were two years in and we had still not launched. And so it was kind of terrifying. Mm. Now, what a leader has to do in that scenario is you just steal yourself, you compartmentalize the emotion, you deal with that separately, and you come up with a plan. And the plan that I wanted to come up with was, let's find a definition of product market fit. Mm. Let's find a metric so I could explain to the wonderful people who are working with me that we didn't have it. Yeah. And that would also give us a methodology to optimize it. So mm. I searched high and low. I read everything I could find. I spoke with all the experts. Yeah. And then I found a gentleman by the name of Sean Ellis. The growth hacking guy. Exactly. Yeah, he, yeah. he came up with the, uh, with the term growth hacker. Yeah. And before he came up with the term growth hacker, mm. he actually ran early growth at many great companies, uh, Dropbox, Dropbox Logmein, yeah. Eventbrite, you got it. Uh, and during this period of his career, mm. he found a way to measure product market fit. Yeah. Simply ask your users the following question. Mm. How would you feel if you could no longer use the product? And then measure the percentage that say very disappointed and you give them three possibilities yeah. very disappointed somewhat disappointed and not disappointed mm. it turns out that the benchmark the threshold for product market fits is 40% very disappointed yeah and this has been benchmarked across hundreds of venture backed startups if more than 40% of your users mm. would be very disappointed without your product then you should focus on growing your company. If less than 40% of your users would be very disappointed without your product, then you'll probably struggle to grow. Mm. And, and I've seen there's like a, almost like academic research on this to show real case studies of this happening, right? And uh, I think Heaton Shah, who's actually recording with me straight after this, uh, who's a kind of prominent guy in Silicon Valley, I think he kind of did this for Slack, I think it was. Um, I think you've even written about this in your blog post. But just saying, not only has you've got a case study of your own company, but there are other companies like Dropbox, like Slack and others that have kind of gone through this sort of methodology. Right? That's right, yeah. Heaton did uh, some very good early work in this area to, to popularize and to, to yeah. teach people about this metric. And he uh, did a survey early in Slack's life cycle about Slack posed that very question yeah. to 731 people. Mm. And 51% of those said they would be very disappointed without Slack. Mm. Now, 51% is greater than 40%, therefore Slack has product market fit. Yeah. And you could argue that you don't need a fancy questionnaire or survey to tell mm. you that Slack has product market fit. <laughs> yeah. Clearly it does. Yeah. But I think the really interesting thing about that example is it shows just how hard it is to beat that benchmark. Mm. It's like, not like Slack has 60 or 70 or 80%. It's yeah. just 50%. It's only 10% more than 40. And what are the other options? There's very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, somewhat disappointed, and not disappointed. So it's just those three. That's right. And it's quite interesting, even when I've studied like market research at university in the marketing modules, it's very specific the way it's worded. There's like a negative, like you're focusing on a negative, like I would be, sorry, not negative, uh, you're focusing on the fact you'd be disappointed versus the opposite, which is I am really happy to use this product. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, so I think the reason behind that is if you ask people how they feel about a product and you give them positive potential responses, yeah. uh, I think it invites more bias. Yeah. People are more likely to be polite. Mm. Uh, and it also doesn't get to the nub, mm. the crux, the heart of the matter of how necessary has your product become mm. for people's lives. Yeah. And if you're trying to build a company that's going to stand the test of time, let's say a 100-year company, yeah. you really do have to build a product that matters, a product that ultimately people come to depend on because it's just so incredible at what it does. Yeah. And that's what this 
product uh, sorry this question gets to the heart of mm. uh, and in that sense it's actually somewhere between Paul Graham's question of do people want it <laughs> yeah. and Sam Altman's question of do people talk about it mm. it's almost like a third leg to mm. that tent of do people need it and would they feel sad without it yeah now if you get all three then you really have something yeah and is this the concept of the high expectation customer is this a within that realm too or is that kind of take we're going to probably move into that yeah in a that, second, that's a, that's a fourth slice or a fourth way to look at this yeah. that, that's actually a for me it was a part of the engine that we came up with to derive product market fit okay so could we go into that a little bit so thanks for the background because that's really helpful and just uh, you know for as someone who's kind of studied this space a little bit myself what what drew me to this and the reason i wanted to talk to you about it at length today is because anyone can say this is how you find product market fit and it's very qualitative right to say you know and i love the simplicity of paul graham's uh when you've made something that people want but i guess that begs the question well when when do you hit that stage what are the indicators of that happening and i think what is great with this approach is you actually have something tangible to look at and the metric that you've mentioned is a great way to measure that over time as well because let's say 10 years ago gmail might have had 40% or, or above and I'm pretty sure now it might not be the case so um, so let, let's dig into that a little bit more right so you've now found this methodology or you have found a way to measure product market fit now what happens next like how do you now take this into action and, and actually start to survey your customers and that sort of stuff absolutely so now we're in the uh, the full journey of the product market fit engine and uh, for those who who haven't come across this, this is a step-by-step -step process mm. that we came up with that allows you to systematically and methodologically increase that product market fit score. Mm. And it basically works almost every single time. Mm. So here's what you do. So the step one is survey. You send that question and three other questions to all of your users. Uh, so that question is, how would you feel without this product? Give them the three answers. Uh, the second question is, who do you think this product is best for? Mm. Uh, the third question is, what is the main benefit of this product to you? And the fourth question is, how can we improve this product for you? And those are the four minimum questions that you need to ask mm. that let the rest of the engine work. Now, once you get back all of the results, you want to analyze the answers to question number one. Yeah. which is the key question, how would you feel without the product? And you want to look at the percentage of people that say, oh, we'd be very disappointed without mm. your product. Mm. Now, the actual result for Superhuman in the summer of 2017 was only 22%. Yeah. We very clearly did not have product market fit. Now, that might seem really sad, but it was actually great because I can now explain that to the team and say, hey, chaps, mm. we don't have this. We need to go and optimize this. Yeah. And I also had a plan for how we would increase it. So here's what you do. You want to move on to step two of the engine, yeah. uh, which is to segment. Now, product market fit is an interesting two-sided variable. Mm. You can not only change the product, which is what most people think about doing, you can also change the market. This is oft overlooked. Yeah. And the way that I recommend you do this is let's take all of the survey results that you have and let's develop the concept of your highest expectation customer. Mm. And this is where we take a little detour into a different framework altogether, the HXC, the highest expectation customer. And this is a concept I learned from Julie Supan. Now, Julie led early marketing at Airbnb, Dropbox, many other great mm. companies. And the highest expectation customer is this. It is the most discerning person in your target demographic. Uh, others aspire to be like them because they see them as clever or judicious yeah. or insightful and they will use your product for its greatest benefit and most importantly they will help spread the word. Mm. These are the people that you want to identify and optimize around. Now I know it's a pretty abstract example so yeah. I'll give I'll give two examples I'll give Dropbox I'll give Airbnb. So the Dropbox HXC is highest expectation customer. That, yeah that's right. right. Yeah. Uh, is uh, technically very savvy, they're generally quite organized, uh, they're very trusting, and ultimately, 
They just want to know that Dropbox has their back when it comes to their life's work. Yeah. I'm an example of a Dropbox HXC. I'm sure many of the listeners today are here also. Yeah. Now the Airbnb HXC is very different. Yeah. They don't just want to travel. They want to visit like they belong. They want mm. to go to Paris and experience it like they really Like a local. It. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And Airbnb rose to its early success by catering to these tastemakers and these influencers. Yeah. And every product has its own HXC. Mm. So how do you calculate yours? Well, take all of those survey responses. Focus only on those that said they would be very disappointed without your product. Yeah. And then analyze the answers to question number two. Who do you think this product would be best for? Mm. And here's a little miracle. You'll know this as a marketing professional, yeah. but I think relatively few people do. It turns out that your happiest users will answer that question by describing themselves, yeah. but in the words that matter most to them. Mm. So you get a double whammy. It's like a two for one. Not only do you get mm. to learn who your product is best for, you get the marketing copy that will resonate most with them. Mm, love that. And you can directly use this copy on your landing so page. So do you remember what yours were, like examples, what people wrote to that question? Oh yeah, it was stuff like, uh, the keyboard shortcuts make me feel superhuman. I yeah. can do everything from the keyboard, uh, yeah. twice as fast as Gmail. I enter a state of flow. I've never been mm. this focused. Uh, I feel like I lose all sense of time and I do my email twice as fast. You know, th These were the comments that we got. Do you think some of those terms around twice as fast, did that come from, from their language from the surveys because now I see you guys use that all the time or did you say that twice as fast originally and then they've kind of put two and two together oh that came from the language of came the from them oh yeah. wow okay and I'm a big believer in uh, some of your best marketing copy yeah. will be the things that your highest expectation customers say mm. and the way that they describe themselves yeah when you say highest expectation, are those people also the ones that are going to be the most disappointed when there's a big change in the product? Like, you know, if you think of redesigns that have happened, Facebook, Reddit, like massive, or when Google Reader went away, like the amount of protests online <laughs> around stuff like that, right? Like, is that is that the kind of double-edged sword? Or do you find they're also just the people that are the biggest kind of cheerleaders? I think there's probably a high degree of overlap between the people who get vocal about change and the highest expectation customer, mm -hmm. but it's not the definition of that group. Okay. The, the core definition of that group is they will appreciate the greatest benefit of your product, yeah. they'll help spread the word, and other people want to be like them. Yeah. Now, we, let's say that uh, you, or we were talking about how you identify them, right? Yeah. So take all of your very disappointed customers, these are the people by definition who really love your product, analyze their answers to question number two, which yeah. is who is the product best for? And you'll start to get a sense of, um, of who they are. Uh, and you can then turn that into a rich and detailed description of your highest expectation mm. customer. Uh, and now, once you have that, you wanna go back and this is sort of getting into step two and three of the engine. Mm. And you wanna figure out the answer to two further questions which is why do people really love your product? Yeah. And what holds people back from loving your product? And and when you when you look at that as a second question, one of the things that stood out to me which sounds counterintuitive was that you're actually disregarding a segment at this stage, right? That's right. Did I understand? It? So not only and I think this is something I've struggled with and most people listening to this I'm sure do this. Let's say I'll use my podcast as an example. I put out my podcast for the first time. I tell everyone in the world that I know I've got a new podcast. And it happens to be 98% of people that I'm friends with or my friends and family, or friends on social media, probably aren't necessarily the number one users or listeners for the show, right? But because I know them, I'm hoping they're gonna be supportive. And then you start getting this feedback from people. And in the grand scheme of it, it's quite a small sample size of your overall audience. But it's the people that know you and I'll just give some examples. People that probably weren't the right listeners in the first place or the right users the way you describe them. Someone said to me once, well, my commute is 20 minutes in the morning, so it better be less than 20 minutes. And someone else said, well, it should be a narrative form, blah, blah, blah. There's a few different examples of feedback like that. And over time, I realized, well, actually, 
that's great, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm trying to have long form, deep discussions on this topic that you can't cover in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. right? So, and then as my podcast grew, I would start getting emails like from random people in Australia. And there's a cop who emailed me like a few days ago from, from, uh, from Southern California who I've never met before and is saying like it's helping him figure out his retirement because he wants to start a company. And it's like stuff like that, like, those are the people I'm saying, well, they're the people that I'm building this for, right? So uh, how do you kind of differentiate between those people if you don't have a survey? Or is that why the survey is really important? Because you actually have an easy way to kind of dissect the data. What about in your conversations? Because you would be onboarding people on the phone and stuff like that. What about the feedback from those people? Yeah, so I actually did in-person onboardings. I did the first few hundred in the company uh, and there is no replacing that. I, you know, you can't say, yeah. use the survey and you don't then have to talk to your customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that would lead to disaster. But where the survey is really critical is, back to your previous point, mm. you know who to politely disregard and you know who to double down on. Yeah. So most companies will find, when they do the survey, that very disappointed score will be in the region of 15 to 25%, let's say. Yeah. They're not disappointed segments. These are the people who really don't care about your product. Probably another 15 to 20%. And the largest percentage of the pie, mm. maybe half of all the respondents, are only going to be somewhat disappointed. Yeah. Now, what most startups do, and this is so dangerous, is that they just start acting on the feedback from that someone, somewhat disappointed crowd. Yeah. And this will lead to a muddled, unclear, incoherent product. Mm. So how do you know who to listen to? Mm. Well. You take the answers to the question, what is the main benefit of the product to you? Limit it to only the people who said they'd be very disappointed without your product. Mm. Summarize that into one singular main benefit. And for superhuman, it's speed. You get through your yeah. email twice as fast. Mm. And then you use that main benefit to segment the somewhat disappointed slice. Got it. So you're kind of taking that and now the people that are kind of further down where they're saying may, they're kind of maybes, they're on the fence, you, but they, they do resonate with the speed. So they love the speed, but they're still on the fence. Then you can go and find out why they're on the fence. Exactly. So. Because there'll be two types of people in that segment. Mm. There'll be the people for whom speed is the thing, yeah. but something, and probably something small, is holding them back from falling in love with the product. And then there'll be people for whom speed isn't the thing, perhaps it's offline, mm. but something is holding them back. Well, here's the thing. If you build the things that are holding them back, if they don't actually resonate with the main benefit of your product, they'll never fall in love with mm. it, no matter what you do. Mm. So in a world where you're drowning in feedback, and most startups are drowning in feedback, yeah. you have to filter it down to the stuff that's gonna increase the number of people that fall in love with your product. Mm. You know, to take the, take the example of your podcast, uh, it sounds like one of the main benefits of your podcast might be the frank, detailed, long-form discussions that you get to have yeah. with entrepreneurs and people who are building cool stuff. Yeah. And there is a set of people for whom a benefit would be fits inside my commute. Yeah, exactly. But if you act on their feedback, it will probably take you in an unhelpful direction. Exactly. So you need to find a way to figure out who to listen to. Mm. And so you might run the survey, get the responses back, and realize that the main benefit is detailed long-form conversations with people who know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Now, what can you do to double down on that? And what can you do to address the feedback, but specifically from those people? Mm. That will lead you to a much better product. Love that. Um, that's great, man. That's really, I love just getting into the nuance of all feedback isn't the same. And I think that's an obvious thing, but to actually act on that is very different. So one question I'd love to go into on this is quite tactical, but probably useful for people to hear. What you've you've talked about the questions you've used, but what tool did you, do you I'm assuming you just use like email and like a service like Typeform or something. Is that what you guys used? Yes, absolutely. So we've built a homegrown system to do this. Mm. Uh, it's key that you only survey your users once they've experienced the core benefit of your product. That's, yeah. You know, for most apps, that means using it two or three times, doing the core loop, whatever that loop is. Yeah. In Superhuman, we say that you have to have sent at least 20 emails 
Uh, and typically this means that we survey our user uh, in the second week of mm. use. We send an email with a link to a Typeform survey uh, that then gets aggregated up into Typeform. I believe we use Zapier yeah. to uh, copy that data over into Airtable, which mm. we're currently using as uh, the glue that ties all of our data together, yeah. uh, and then other things pull the data outside of that. Mm. Great, that's really helpful for people to, do, do you guys share, like is that quite simple to set up, like the Zapier Airtable integration? Uh, it's not hugely simple, it's yeah. probably day, a day's worth of work or so. Okay. Uh, if, I, I think it's, it's probably easy enough to do if you just sort of bang on it for a day or okay, two. Okay, cool. That's good to know. So I like, so we got to the stage of politely passing on certain types of customers, right? And we kind of got gone into how you've, how you've uh, segmented that. Then what happens? So now you've figured out, okay, we've got our number one customer, our super fans, the ones that can't live without a product. Mm -hmm. They love speed. Then we've got the ones on the fence that do love speed, but they're waiting for something else. And it, from my understanding, that was a mobile app. Right? Was that your initial, uh, one of the number one things people were looking for? Yes, this was back in 2017, and it, yeah. was, it was very early days for the company. We had not yet released our mobile app to our user base, and so that was, uh, in a sense, the most obvious and non-interesting biggest thing that people were asking for. Yeah. But it was really the long tail stuff beyond that, mm. where it wasn't necessarily obvious to us mm. that makes for building an amazing product. Okay. What were some examples of, of the long tail? Do you remember? Yeah, it was things like uh, a better attachment handling. For okay. example, uh, you know, people wanted their attachments available when they were offline. Uh, it was things like better search. We had invested heavily in making the search really, really fast. Yeah. Uh, but there are other small pieces around a world-class search experience that at the time we hadn't built. Uh, integration of your calendar. Mm. Uh, today we have a really great calendar integration where even as you're typing about an event, you can see whether or not you're free on that day. Yeah. At the time, there was no calendar integration at all. Great. Uh, so it was stuff like this that people wanted that would take the product to the next level. Yeah, actually, since we're talking about it, I would love to call out one of my favorite things I've seen you guys build, which is the snippets. Mm -hmm. Like, so for example, if anyone's uh, experienced this, someone does an intro of email and they say, hey, Bilal, me, Kevin, and then everyone does reply minus to BCC, and there's this thing we all do all the time, and you have kind of have to drag the name up to BCC and then write it manually. You guys have a command, I think it's like command I or something like that, and it kind of does it all for you automatically. Like so, that, like that is a level of detail that it sounds kind of simple, but when you're using that every day, you you start to notice, and it's a great feeling when it actually works, and you haven't had to think about it, and you can focus on the email. So I just wanted to call that out because it's actually a really cool feature. Um, was there any any other examples of like snippets or really th cool things that people use the email for, um, or like uh, sorry features that people really love? Yeah, I think that's a great example, and it, it chains really well with some of our other features. Uh, so. I spend a lot of time doing what I call pseudo sales. I'm not yeah, yeah. actually a salesperson, uh, but I, I do a lot of the sales for the company. A lot of the high profile introductions to potential customers get made directly to me. Yeah. Uh, and of course I want to act on those as rapidly as possible. Mm. And the thing that I do to start is that BCC dance, I have to reply all and then drag the sender to BCC and then yeah. drag the other guy to the to field and then say, hey, thank you such and such for this introduction, nice to meet you. And then I have to say, um, please fill out the survey, please also meet uh, Sahar, she's our SDR. Yeah. Uh, and then please also meet Caitlin, uh, they're my executive assistant. And then I have to BCC the CRM. And if I were to do all of that in Gmail, it would be about 20 to 30 different clicks and mm. take me north of five minutes. Yeah. And in Superhuman, in two commands, one is the intro command that you just talked about and the second is a snippet, mm. I can actually chain all of these things together. I can reply all, I can move the yeah. sender to BCC, I can move the other person to two, I can BCC the CRM, I can CC the SDR, I can CC my EA, and I can type out a really nice, well-formatted, polite email and just hit send. Yeah. So that's part of how people get through their inbox twice as fast. Mm. And that also works on your phone as well. That's great, love it, man. Um, so moving on from from that, you then get to the, to the third big stage, which is you've understood what people want 
now you translate that to a product roadmap is my understanding or do we we didn't really cover that properly right so how, how do you now translate that data and say well these are the things people are asking for how do you kind of prioritize and stack rank what you need to do there for sure so we used the question what is the main benefit of superhuman to you mm. uh, to understand what people really really love that's key yeah uh, we then segmented the somewhat disappointed crowd down to the subset for whom the main benefit resonates. Yeah. The next step, the part that we didn't cover in too much detail, is we look at how can we improve the product for you? That's the fourth and final question. Mm. And now you have two lists. You have the list of things that people love, mm. and you have the list of things that hold back the somewhat disappointed crowd for whom the main benefit resonates. And this is where the product's market fit engine gets really cool because it can essentially automatically write your roadmap for you. Yeah. You go down both of those lists, and what I would recommend is in each quarter, let's say, you spend half of your time doubling down on the stuff that people really love mm. and half of your time doubling down on the stuff that's holding back people from falling in love with your product. Okay. And it's really important that you do a mixture of these two activities. I've mm. seen startups fail by doing only one of the above. If you only double down on what people love, yeah. you won't increase the size of the pie that's very disappointed. You won't increase the set of people who really, really love your product. Yeah. And if you only act on user feedback, then you will initially increase the size of that pie, mm. but eventually a competitor will overtake you because you're not continuing to invest in the differentiating stuff that makes your product delightful and magical. Kind of like Gmail. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's the, you could argue it's the, the life cycle of any product mm. is at a certain point, uh, the, the name of the game becomes scaling and yeah. growth uh, and constantly bringing in more revenue or growing that user graph. Uh, but I like to believe in building a product where you're constantly investing yeah. in delighting your users. Great. And that kind of brings us to the last part of this whole um, methodology is, you know, repeating this. So now you've gone through this whole cycle. What I love to see in your blog post anyway was this is your number one metric is my understanding. Is this still the case that this is what you guys are reporting on? Like how many people are going to be disappointed if if, if sure, they lost this product. It's the number one metric of the product organization. Okay. Uh, the, the company as a whole, our number one metric is is growth, as it should always be, I believe, for yeah. any startup. You know, Paul Graham wrote that famous essay, Startup Equals Growth, mm. uh, where he uh, postulated, and I, I would agree with this, that the whole point of a startup is to grow fast. Yeah. Uh, so that actually turns out to be our number one metric. Uh, but that in a sense is a lagging indicator. Mm. How do you get to a point where you can responsibly and sustainably grow fast? Yeah. Well, it's the responsibility of the product organization to figure out the product's market fit metric. Yeah, and that's the kind of, a, to my earlier question about where product market fit fits within this life cycle, would it be a correct statement for me to say, your opinion would be, you need to find product market fit before you're investing in real growth? Because if, you are trying to grow at that stage and you haven't actually nailed what people love about your product, you're gonna kind of spread yourself too thin or kind of uh, grow to a stage where you've got 80% of your user base who don't actually love your product. I mean, or is that something you're having to do at the same time? Exactly, I, I would do the former. I, I wouldn't try and grow before to okay. your own satisfaction you have product market fit because mm. you'll either burn goodwill with a potential user base yeah. or you'll end up with a user base who kind of don't really love your product uh, and either way you'll be wasting time yeah and that's also comes back to if you think of you've talked about vc backed startups today or that's what we've talked about today what about if you're bootstrapping you know what's your opinion on that because you've you're vc backed in this case i think report was reportive also vc backed it was yes. right so is there uh, you know there's plenty of people building great companies that aren't vc backed um even in the SaaS space. So I, how, how, do you think that changes if you're not VC backed? Like, do you, cause you don't necessarily always have the runway to, to be able to take three, four years to nail the product. I actually think it's easier if you're not VC backed. Okay. By definition, bootstrapped companies tend to be 
at the very least rum and profitable in the sense that it can support the one or two or three founders yeah. relatively early mm. because there's no other way. Like yeah, you have to do. They have to do. Mm. Uh, and so bootstrapped companies find this process easier to do. It's actually more mm. challenging for VC companies because there is this expectation of growth. Of growth, okay. And so what I've done is I have calibrated uh, with our investors, who are some of the best investors around, you know, yeah. first round capital led our seed round. In, uh, Andreessen Horowitz just read our Series B, uh, and every single one of our investors is on board with the idea that responsible growth mm. in the long term almost always beats and is better than growth at all costs. Yeah, and here is a way I suggest that you can determine whether or not your growth will be responsible. Mm. That's great. I love that, man. Because uh, I, I definitely think we're, I mean, if you're looking at the bigger macro market beyond just tech, beyond startup world, you know, the stock market's the highest it's ever been. We've had eight, 10 years of growth. Do, do, do you think that the way that VC backed startups are working in Silicon Valley is going to be sustainable? Do you think that things will change in, you know, in the, let's say there's a recession in two years' time? Do you think that we would really change the approach? in Silicon Valley? It is true to say that we're at a point of Silicon Valley where there is an overabundance of capital. Mm. It's never been as easy as it is now to raise money. Valuations have never been this high. Mm. Uh, and by the way, there are definitely negative effects For to sure. that and negative consequences of mm. that. Uh, number one, you get companies starting that probably shouldn't really be started. Yeah, You get companies started by founders who are in it because it's relatively easy. Yeah. Uh, and 10 years ago, let's say, they wouldn't have had the grit, the determination, mm. the resilience to get through the hard times that we used to have to get through. Yeah. Uh, and also, as a result, there has never been so much competition to hire people here. It's mm. become incredibly difficult to recruit people inside of Silicon Valley. Mm. Uh, and this is true even for the best startups. Yeah. Uh, we ourselves, you know, we have a, a great brand, uh, a, a very well capitalized, yeah. uh, but we're also looking to potentially hire elsewhere. We're looking at uh, various cities in Canada and across America. Uh, so there are definitely negative consequences to mm. the amount of capital that's currently available. Uh, to the idea of recession, I think this is a really interesting question. Mm. And it's a question that I'm not particularly well qualified to answer. I'm, I'm not smart when it comes yeah. to these things. But I ask the same question <laughs> yeah. all the time. I'm sure, you're thinking about the, how that's going to impact you if that was the case. Oh, absolutely. Mm. I, I have to. I have to be ready for a mm. recession, and so I ask this question all the time uh, to our biggest investors, who are way more clued in on this than I am. Yeah, and and their answer is consistently the same. There is nothing fundamentally wrong with the economy right now. Mm. Uh, all of the fundamentals in literally any metric you care to measure, whether mm. it's uh, unemployment uh, or anything else, it's all actually fine. Yeah. It's actually not been <laughs> this good for quite some time. Uh, so you could argue from a business cycle perspective that we are overdue yeah. and that it will therefore definitely happen <laughs> inside of the next two years. But the smartest people I know are saying that it probably won't. Mm. Right, assuming it's something will fundamentally have to go wrong yeah. with the economy, or there'll be some external poke to the economy, uh, like like some kind of war situation uh, to trigger it. Mm. And in the meantime, things are probably just going to continue uh, the way that they are. That's interesting. Are. Yeah, and I, I guess it's a billion dollar question, and I guess even the smartest people in the world, there's going to be people that on both sides, in the same way there were people on both sides in 2007 and eight. Uh, but yeah, and I'm also not an economist. I mean, I studied economics, but I'm not a real economist. Is um, And I would say the only kind of vulnerability I see in the long-term macroeconomic state is kind of the deficit, right? Like if you think of we're basically printing money, um, and again, this is way above my pay grade, but just I think that's the kind of area where some people think it's fragile and just think that is kind of a almost like a kind of a bubble based on that. So anyway, I think we'll have to save that for another day, but uh, really good to kind of touch on. So first of all, thanks for uh, going into all of that detail, man. I think I've listened to most of your interviews and 
and I've, you've got some great interviews out there, but I think we really went into a level of detail that we haven't necessarily heard elsewhere. So I hope this can accompany your blog post as a great reference point to go into. Um, as we kind of close out, there are some other areas I'd love to kind of just um, touch on. You've done an amazing job of creating a product that people love and are delighted with when they're actually using the product. Um, there's a couple of things that I think are really key in that. One is your background as a video game uh, developer or a visual designer, I think you said, um, and we'll go into that in a second. Um, so I think you guys have actually created a product where you're purposely creating moments within your experience that feel like the, the kind of rush you get when you're playing a game, is my understanding. Um, and the second part, really quickly, is your human onboarding. Right, and that's kind of counterintuitive, right? A lot of people who start companies, especially an email software company, would say, well, we want to create something scalable that is sign up online, give us $30, we never want to speak to you ever again, and just keep like giving us money every month. Whereas you guys have said, actually, we've got 220,000 people ready to pay on a wait list, and you're not allowed to join until you have a half an hour call with someone. So just talk me through that decision and why that's so crucial in developing, you know, um, customers that have become fans and, and then it kind of spread the word through that experience. Sure. So it is true. We do onboard every user in yeah. a video call. We spend half an hour with each customer. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the genesis of this wasn't because we, we thought it would uh, be good for the business, although that definitely turns out to be the case. The yeah. genesis was customer development. Mm. I wanted to spend the earliest moments of our users' interaction with the product with them so I could see them use it, so I could demonstrate the product to them, so that I could take that time also to ask them what they thought yeah. and to run some pricing analysis surveys in person. Mm. Uh, and to see all of the bugs that the, the software inevitably had mm. so we could fix that for next week's cohort of users. Yeah, And those initial onboardings were perhaps one and a half hours to two hours long each. They were they were long. Yeah, uh, That's because I was doing all of the above. Mm. And then as we got into the flow and into the rhythm of doing that, we realized something remarkable was happening. Mm. These users were becoming power users at a way higher rates than should have happened. Mm. You know, they than just the average user who would have just signed up. Sure, exactly. Yeah. Like they, they were really viral. Mm. They churned out way less. They retained way more. Mm. Uh, they spread word of mouth more than you would really expect people to do. And we realized this was because of the personal connection to me. Mm. Regardless of whether they knew me beforehand. Yeah. They had a real human connection to the company. Yeah. And I guess you could you could afford to do this because it's a paid product. Yes. Right. If you were a complete free product, it might not be economically efficient uh, to be able to actually give every single free user an hour, uh, half an hour, or an hour of time to do this. Whereas if your lifetime value is several hundred dollars, maybe thousands of dollars in the long run, then you can afford to, you know, as a company, make those people power users exactly and and I think when I've uh, signed up for this in the past I think you guys also ask questions and say well how do you use email because one you're getting the information but two you can then customize and bring up um, parts of your product that I might not have known just by following some video tutorial online so it's really smart I think it's clearly working really well um, and on Twitter I don't know if you remember this but we had a kind of back and forth uh, around um, the virality of your product and you had mentioned that for every one superhuman user they also bring in another person is that still kind of an accurate uh, amount yeah it's uh, incredibly viral at this point so it's very high between 60 and 70 percent okay of our new users each week wow. are word of mouth referred from the previous week from just the previous week yeah. oh wow that's so it's recency as well it's yes. not just three months ago yeah Wow. So yeah, we're we're at the point now where each paying customer creates on average one more paying customer. Okay, amazing. Um, I love that, man. I think it's definitely something that a lot of people can um, take on board for their companies, especially for paid users, right? And I, even in my world, I have a digital marketing consultancy business, 
right? As that scales and I bring on more people that work within my team, like, I don't want to just say like, hey, here's a person on my team that you should be working with. Like there's benefit to having everyone talk at one point and really understand and, and set a and also create a relationship, especially in the B2B space. That's a huge part of my old job was sales. Like the whole reason we had a job was to create relationships. And I think especially as traditional product people, a lot of people don't like that concept and they just want to think we create the best product and the best product wins. And unfortunately, humans still need to speak to humans and business is still done with other people. And as consumers, sometimes we need to be able to pick up the phone and speak to someone. So I think there's something to be taken from that. The last thing to cover off on, uh, so thanks for your your thoughts on that, is around gaming. So tell me a little bit about your background and how it relates to gaming and how you're kind of applying the, that logic into creating your product. For sure. As I mentioned earlier, I've been programming since I was about eight years yeah. old. And the, the way that I got into that was by wanting to make my own video games. Yeah. Uh, and so I did, and I did that all the way through growing up. Uh, and then I worked very briefly professionally as a video game designer. I actually worked on RuneScape, which mm. at the time was the world's largest free online role-playing game. Yeah. And it was tremendous amount of fun. Mm. There is uh, little that compares to building a video game and seeing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people play it simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, so I had that experience. And I've always considered myself to be a game designer. Yeah. Now at Superhuman, we make software like it's a game. Yeah. You know, we don't worry about what users want. We don't worry about what users need. <laughs> we obsess about how users feel. Mm. And we have a saying internally that what we make people feel is just as important as what we make. And what we actually make mm. is joy in software form. Mm. It's a very different type of product management. There are no, if you think about a game, it doesn't need to exist. Mm. There are no user requirements. It's entertainment. That's exactly. But yeah. it's there to create a feeling. And the feeling that we want to create is joy. Mm. So, you know, you can get deep into the theory of game design. There are certain things that comprise a game. Things like a goal, yeah. controllers, uh, a cycle, interaction, yeah. pace. Uh, and we have deliberately designed Superhuman to have many, many game-like qualities. Yeah. On the surface, it may look like a productivity tool, but underneath there's a, uh, a really an, an immersive game experience that can create this uh, yeah. wonderful sensation of flow. Mm. So first of all, there is a goal, uh, and the goal is to get you to inbox zero. Mm. And even if you weren't the kind of person to do that prior to using Superhuman, mm will strongly suggest and, and recommend, in fact, that you do that inside of Superhuman. So we set up the yeah. goal of the game. Uh, then we give you a tutorial level. So mm. every single video game has a, uh, a tutorial level, a safe place where you can try out some of the, the basic moves yeah. uh, and, and feel comfortable learning how to play your character. Mm. Uh, and it's in that tutorial level that we teach you the controls of the game. Mm. Now, in our case, the controls are the keyboard shortcuts. And mm. the, all the best games in the world have some novel or really, um, really entertaining method of controlling the game. The actual experience of mm. inputting the game and moving your character is by itself joyful mm. and fun. And the way that we've designed our keyboard shortcuts, it makes it feel like a video game. It's, yeah. it's joyful and it's fun. And in that onboarding, you get to experience the, uh, the shortcuts and the controls to the game. That's cool. Uh, and then the very medium of email itself mm. is game-like. How so? Well, uh, there are, it, to use video game jargon, there are non-player characters or NPCs, <laughs> as we would say, yeah. uh, enemies, so to speak. Yeah. And these are the, <laughs> the messages that come in yeah. outside of your control. Uh, and, and there's a certain cadence to them. You know, they'll, they'll peak around the morning, then they'll slow down around lunchtime, then they'll pick up again in the afternoon and mm. slow down again in the evening. And so there's a natural rhythm to gaming, uh, sorry, to, to email, which is like a game. Yeah. Uh, and you don't necessarily control that. Yeah. Uh, and each message itself 
is, is variable as well. Some are going to be really quick and easy, yeah. uh, and some are going to take a lot of work to deal with. And mm. again, that's like a game. Some enemies are going to be really quick and fast to dispatch, and then you're going to have the, the boss-like enemies. Yeah. You have the boss-like emails that <laughs> yeah, are really yeah. going to take 10, 15 minutes to, to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we've built this, this software to have many game-like elements, but also the, the experience of being a superhuman customer, our, our whole user life cycle. Mm. So we do have a 20, 220,000 person wait list, but you can skip the wait list. And here mm. is how we say, if you want to skip the wait list, then it's it's easy. Just find a referral and the best place to look is on Twitter yeah. from someone who's already using superhuman. Mm. Now, those of us who play a lot of video games will immediately recognize yeah. this as a side quest mm. or as a mission. It's, hey, this is a small little thing that you have to do. Yeah, yeah. And it's like the start of the video game. Uh, and I do, I do believe that to a very large degree, the fact that we've made our software like this mm. is part of what makes it joyful. It makes it fun. It helps our users achieve a sensation of a flow and a focus. Yeah, love that, man. Yeah, I think because there's a term of gamification, which is you know, a widely used term to to describe many different interactions with a company or a product, but you're going in a little bit more vivid detail around like characters and, and that sort of stuff too. So I think you're, you're kind of, this is a new area that you're kind of thinking or sharing a lot more about. So when you do get to the stage, when you write your epic uh, post about this in the future, we should definitely get you back on the show to do a full deep dive into that again. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, listen, man, this has been amazing. We've covered so much. Um, we're getting to the end of our time here. Again, I want to thank TuneIn Radio for hosting us here today. It's been really cool. We're doing a Silicon Valley takeover in San Francisco. Um, so we will have to wrap up. The last thing I'd love to kind of just ask you is, look, we're both from the UK and we've grown up uh, in the UK mainly. Um, what's been your experience being in America, man? Like you've been here, I think, 10 years, you said. I've been here for six already. So just curious to kind of hear your, you know, what it's been like for you here. Uh, it's It's been incredible. Mm. You know, I feel fortunate to have, uh, to a degree, lived the American dream. Yeah. Start, moved here, started a company, sold it, uh, started another one. Yeah. And things are going great. Uh, it's It's very different to the UK, of course. Yeah. Uh, Silicon Valley is an especially incredible place. People mm. who are very generous with their time. Uh, we have a pay it forwards culture. Yeah, uh, you can ask anybody for help, and anyone will actually help. Yeah, you. yeah. Uh, that's not to say we don't have our problems. Uh, homelessness is, is a huge problem here in San Francisco. You will yeah. be seen as you're walking around the streets. Yeah, uh, and unlike the UK, you know we have a, a very different education system. We have a very different health system. Yeah. Uh, and it was a bit of a shocker to me moving over to here and uh, experiencing that firsthand. Because I have just I was talking about this on the weekend because one of my friends asked me, going from a big safe place like Google and getting great healthcare, obviously, uh, to then going out on your own, one of the biggest things that surprised me is I wasn't really ready for that. You know, you can have all the money in the world, but when you have to pay $600 a month or whatever it is for healthcare, it kind of like hits you a little bit, especially being a Brit when you've got the NHS. Is there anything that surprised you when you when you kind of moved here? I think it was mostly positive surprise. Yeah. I was positively surprised at just how incredibly helpful yeah. anybody was. <laughs> That's the upside. Yeah. yeah now I remember sure. the first week, uh, and this was before actually even we moved here, uh, the first week that my reportive co-founder Martin and I were here, yeah. we turned up in Silicon Valley and we had one meeting scheduled on a Monday mm. and you know we were being good entrepreneurs and so at the end of yeah. that one meeting we said are there three other people that you recommend we should talk with and yeah. we kept on doing that yeah. by the end of that week we had had over 60 meetings and Wednesday Thursday and Friday were packed back to back that's amazing and that's special that, that is, only yeah. happens here it doesn't happen in yeah. the UK or anywhere else I, I, that's one of the main reasons I've stayed here many also personal reasons but just like the upside for me, especially if you're an entrepreneurial person, uh, you can start companies around the world, of course, but there is something about the States. The upside of it is people are more willing to listen at least. And, and even a customer, like if you're trying to pitch to someone, like the amount of people I've literally cold emailed, uh, one example, Jason Calicanis, who's this week in Startup Guy, who's also coming on this podcast. 
I like, you know those emails that you get from the CEO of a company? In fact, I think we spoke over email because I got like probably one of those automated emails and I responded to you and you actually responded back. So I kind of always respond to those emails just to see is anyone actually responding to this or, and I, I never really expect it, but I've been really surprised. I've, so many things have come from those emails and I find you can do that in the UK of course, but generally people are a little bit more open to it here. And I think there's a, a multiplier effect of that kind of positivity uh, and momentum that's built. Um, so listen, man, I love being having you on here. Um, thanks for being on the show. And this has been super helpful and useful to talk about. Where people can follow you on online, is that, where can they check out your stuff? Yeah, so I am on Twitter, yeah. Rahul Vora, that's R-A-H-U-L. So we'll link to that. Yeah. Uh, and of course, available at email, and I will reply. <laughs> Rahul you heard at superhuman.com. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, man. And again, uh, if you're listening to this on audio, you could go on uh, youtube.com forward slash creator lab FM if you want to see the visuals. We've also got little snippets we put on Instagram, Twitter, uh, all of the link, uh, all of the social networks on creator lab FM as well. Thanks, dude. I really appreciate it, man. Thank Thanks you.